We welcome all of you uh, to come for it. I think we've got a good series of talks, and we're starting off with, a, I think, one of the best, in which is looking at the treatment and, and diagnosis of pulmonary emboli. And the person talking to us about it is Fadi Nahab. Fadi came in and took over the pulmonary, em not pulmonary embolus, but the stroke program, and uh, has really made it shine here. He's been the last 10 years the director, both here and in Midtown of the Comprehensive Stroke Program. And now he did such a good job there, he's out trying to help him do the job out at um, Johns Creek. And there, he once that is completed, he'll be the director of the Comprehensive Health Program there at Johns Creek. Body was born in Baghdad, grew up there, then at some point his family moved to California and he went to, and got his uh, undergraduate degree from La Sierra University and then went to Loma Linda where he got his MD degree and then he moved here to the East Coast and uh, started the programs here at, at Emory and dealing with cardiovascular disease and the brain. And we're delighted to have him here. His research interest has been in biomarkers as they help us guide our therapy and guide our management of uh, uh, vascular disease in the brain. And so, Buddy, we're happy to have you here and appreciate your coming. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and uh, yeah, glad to be here. These are my disclosures, uh, which won't be relevant to what we'll be discussing uh, today. So I was asked to start with a case. I always like presentations that start with cases too. So 39-year-old lady presents to an outside hospital in North Georgia, last time seen normal, 10.30 a.m. Past medical history here, hyperlipidemia, depression, active tobacco user, amitriptyline, and trazodone. And she presents with right hemiparesis to a small rural hospital in North Georgia at 12 noon. She gets helicoptered to a primary stroke center just a little bit south of that North Georgia hospital. But by the time she gets there, it's 4 p.m. And at that point, they determine, well, she's not eligible for TPA, so let's go ahead and call the comprehensive stroke center here for possible thrombectomy. She goes on two helicopter rides, shows up here, Last time seen normal is at 10.30 a.m. She's showing up at about seven hours and 15 minutes, and this is what her exam looks like. Severe expressive aphasia, right visual field defect, right lower facial weakness, right arm and leg, basically plegic, unable to sense pain in the right face, arm, and leg. And for those of you who are familiar with our NIH stroke scale scores, uh, it's a 19. So this is a large, severe stroke by localization, which we neurologists like to do, we're thinking a left MCA syndrome. We do a CT scan, and for those of you who don't regularly look at your own CT scan images, we have gotten to looking very closely at subtle changes on non-contrast CT scans, which we'll talk about in the presentation. But what's noticeable here is this represents the right caudate nucleus, and we don't see it on the left side. This represents the right lentiform nucleus, and we don't see it here as well. And there's a little bit of darkness here. And so these are what we call early ischemic changes. What stands out, however, is for a left MCA syndrome, which feeds the bulk of the left hemisphere, the cortex, which is more densely packed and therefore more hyperdense, is still largely intact, despite her coming in at seven hours and 15 minutes. Take her for a thrombectomy, first the angiogram. Angiogram shows a left MCA occlusion. She gets reperfused. You can see now the full left MCA territory uh, open up. And post-procedure MRI basically shows on a DWI image this bright area, hyperintense area in the exact area where we saw the early ischemic changes. There is a very small punctate infarct up at the top here, but largely she's been spared of a full left MCA syndrome infarct. Her 24-hour exam, mild expressive aphasia, but speaking in full sentences now. She's got full visual fields, mild right lower facial weakness. She's got anti-gravity strength, but not full. Mild decreased sensation in the right hemibody side. By 72 hours out, it's got a very mild aphasia, 
Again, mild lower facial weakness, full strength in her right arm and leg, and decreased sensation in the right face, arm, and leg, and her stroke scale has gone from a 19 down to a 3. So many of you uh, think about, and we think about our Lazarus moments. As we'll talk about here, in the world of acute stroke, the Lazarus moments are happening more and more and more, and we're becoming more attuned to the fact that this is what we expect. Now the key is, is identifying the right patients for this procedure. So taking a step back, stroke we have seen progressively have uh, reductions in mortality to where now it's dropped to the fifth leading cause of death in the U.S. While uh, mortality rates from stroke have been dropping, incidence rates have been rising. Current numbers are about 800,000 strokes every year, most of them first attacks, and it remains the leading cause of long-term disability in the U.S. So I like to tell people without uh, the political uh, side of things, you all know you live in a red state, but you may not know you live in a red state because we consider this the stroke belt. The stroke belt has been known for more than half a century as having 20% higher rates of deaths from stroke than the rest of the country. There is actually a stroke buckle to this belt in the coastal plains of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia where you're 40% more likely to die from a stroke than the rest of the country. As Doug was mentioning, I grew up in California, and when I moved out here, and people would say, we just don't know why the stroke belt exists. And when I saw what people ate, I said, really, you don't know? Um, I don't go into it in this talk here, but some of our work and my interests have looked at the dietary habits in and outside of the stroke belt, which I can tell you make a big contribution to this disparity. Nonetheless, in, in the stroke belt, we also look at how people basically organize stroke care in and outside of the stroke belt. And what I want to highlight from this map here is the individual stars represent certified stroke centers based on a 2010 map, which is largely unchanged, except that now some primary stroke centers have gone for comprehensive stroke center designation as Emory University Hospital has. What I want to highlight to you is what goes on in Georgia. There is no shortage of certified stroke centers in Metro Atlanta. Look at South Georgia. We, as well as Jacksonville, as well as Pensacola, get calls from South Georgia, three hours by helicopter, from the nearest comprehensive stroke center with a good candidate for thrombectomy. The challenge is, is by the time the patient arrives at one of those centers, is that it may already be too late. And so a lot of stroke care becomes the organization and making sure how to get patients what they need. There are tremendous gaps of certified stroke centers, as you can see here through the maps. But in the metro regions, uh, there's no lack of them. So it's important that when we think about stroke, rem remembering several key things. 88% of strokes remain ischemic, 12% hemorrhagic. Within the ischemic subset, we think about the most common subtype, which is lacunar or small vessel disease. These are small perforators that one cannot target with thrombectomy. Large artery atherosclerotic disease, cardioembolic causes to the large artery vessels, and even cryptogenic uh, strokes frequently cause large artery occlusive disease that are a target for current reperfusion therapies. And then, of course, within the hemorrhagic realm, most of them intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. While these numbers are there nationally, uh, here at Emory University Hospital, we're one of the largest subarachnoid hemorrhage centers in the country. So our numbers on a monthly basis are actually 50-50 because of the high hemorrhagic referral population. When you look at a, coming, a patient with an acute stroke suspected, it's important to realize that looking at them, you are not going to be able to evaluate whether this is an ischemic or a hemorrhagic stroke. There are things that suggest more likely hemorrhagic versus ischemic, such as a sudden onset focal neurologic deficit typically being more of an ischemic, a smooth symptomatic progression being more hemorrhagic as the bleed is getting larger, especially in those early hours, uh, 
headache, vomiting, being more likely hemorrhagic, but again, basal or thrombosis can be also manifestations with these symptoms. The most important thing is you do not know without getting imaging. And I bring this up because I still see cases of patients referred to us where a patient is having, quote, recurrent TIAs and no imaging has been performed. And then we do the image, and what do we find? We find that the patient is having a hemorrhage that's getting slowly larger. We see a subdural hemorrhage. And in some cases, we see patients who have been increased on their antithrombotics. You know what? They're having recurrent neurologic symptoms. Let's take that aspirin and add Plavix to it mind you, without getting the imaging done. So a really important thing to make sure when you're suspecting stroke TI symptoms, get the imaging done uh, first before deciding on it. So what we do in the acute stroke setting is we wanna optimize perfusion regardless of what that is. Head of bed flat unless the patient is actively vomiting. Studies show that laying the patient flat versus sitting increased cerebral blood flow by 30%. That's valuable when you're in an acute ischemic stroke setting. Initiating normal saline IV fluids, and of course, as we talked about, holding antithrombotic treatment. So as opposed to the cardiologist, we are frequently telling patients, if you're having stroke symptoms, don't chew an aspirin. Just call 911. We'll figure out what you need to be on afterwards. We always do as a standard a blood glucose check. We do neuroimaging. I'll show you pictures of this. CT is at most institutions the preferred imaging tool. It's to rule out bleeding. I say that because frequently, frequently in medical legal cases I'm involved with, patients who went to an ER, ER doc did a CT scan thinking stroke, CT scan was negative, and then they took the stroke out of their differential. All you take out of the differential with a CT scan is a hemorrhagic stroke, not an ischemic stroke. MRI is good for both. The biggest limitation is ha asking an acute stroke patient to lie still for our acute stroke protocol here that we've created is eight minutes. Eight minutes is a long time for somebody to be lying still. And the one thing you don't want to do is waste that time and then have a lot of motion artifact leaving you with, without a diagnostic tool. Vascular imaging with MR, CT, TCD, or conventional angiography. So I showed you with the case that we look for subtleties with non-contrast CT. We've actually divided MCA territories into 10 main locations. And we've defined this as an aspect score. Every early ischemic change in these locations subtracts one from the 10. And as you can imagine, the lower your aspect score, the more early ischemic changes present, the less likely you are to do well with reperfusion, with TPA, or with just supportive care. This is an example, if you can make this out here, but again, we see the cortical ribbon, which is normal. When you lose the cortical, this is the cortical ribbon on the right side. When you lose the cortical ribbon, this is called an insular ribbon sign. This is an early ischemic change of a right MCA ischemic infarct. And so as you get better and better at reading non-contrast CTs, there's a lot of things you can pick up. Uh, and this applies to neurologists as well as radiologists. CTA is fantastic. It requires iodinated contrast, of course. It's obviously made a big impact within the, within the coronary world. Well, it's a, made a big impact in the vascular uh, brain world. So it allows 3D reconstructions that are almost as good as a cerebral angiogram. Most importantly, within one minute, we get a CTA of the head and neck, and we have a good sense of any obstructions and evaluating for large vessel occlusions or not. With that same contrast, we were able to do CT perfusions, which allow us to gauge cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, and also mean transit times. This used to be done in a manual way by radiologists who could take up to 30 minutes to actually process this. With the importance of time and brain tissue, what has 
become and has evolved is now we have an automated processing tool, which we call RAPID, which is at all of our Emory Healthcare sites and uh, actively, actively being uh, instituted at Johns Creek and St. Joe's currently. But what this does is it uses the contrast and in a simplified way compares several things uh, you have. One is the time for the contrast to get into parts of the brain compared to the contralateral side. That's the green. The green represents the tissue at risk in acute ischemia. The purple represents cerebral blood flow compared to the opposite side and gives you this magenta color, which has, be, which has been shown to be an, an excellent predictor of infarct core tissue. Your mismatch between the green and the purple represents how much tissue is potentially salvageable. These are other maps we, we get uh, as part of RAPID, and actually, currently, what we do is with these maps, once they're generated within one minute, we actually get them as an email sent to all of our team so that we can actually be looking at these maps immediately and we basically interpret them uh, in real time. MRI, DWI, Diffusion Weighted Imaging, uh, is still a great tool to use to decide to define what is the core infarct area as shown with hyperintensity on DWI and corresponding hypointensity with the ADC map. Again, the main issue with it is you have to get a patient who's gonna lie still in an acute stroke setting. And so this is something that we don't typically do uh, in the acute stroke setting, taking patients directly to MRI. MRA allows us to get large vessel occlusion assessment without contrast if you're having issues with getting IV in. Uh, the issue is, is about one-third of the time there's a false positive. So our standard here at Emory is actually to do contrast-enhanced MRAs to reduce that false positive rate down to 5% or less. Cerebral angiography remains the gold standard, but we typically go to this when we're planning to intervene, as I'll show you shortly. So from an acute stroke management side, you think about first and foremost blood pressure management. Current guidelines target, if you're planning to give IV TPA to a patient, you need to get the blood pressures to less than 185 over 110, because higher blood pressures are associated with a higher risk for symptomatic hemorrhage. If you're not eligible for TPA, the current AHA ASA guidelines are permissive to 220 over 120. That is a completely arbitrary cutoff. You can have patients who are in the 240s who have no signs of end organ damage and who have mild symptoms and you bring them down to 210, 200 and suddenly they become plegic in front of you. The brain is calling for that blood flow and if you don't have evidence for end organ damage in, in other locations, in it is very important to be careful about dropping blood pressure significantly. We tell our stroke trainees, our neurology trainees that you may have a patient who's eligible for TPA if you just bring down their blood pressures 40 points. But if they've got mild symptoms, you need to think twice about whether you're actually gonna extend that infarct just to give them the opportunity of TPA. And so you may actually end up hurting them rather than helping them if you're dropping this significantly. Hemorrhagic strokes, on the other hand, more and more data shows us that tight early blood pressure control will reduce the early expansion of the hemorrhage. So we strive to get that blood pressure down quickly, and one randomized trial has actually shown that less than 140 is, is the go-to target, despite what patients come in, whether it's 200, 220, et cetera. IVTPA is still the only FDA-approved medic medical therapy for acute ischemic stroke. Many of you are familiar with the FDA indication out to three hours based on the NINS-TPA trial way back now in 1995. It, against placebo, reduced disability by 30% at three months, but it is a clot buster and it increases the hemorrhagic risk of stroke up to 6% versus placebo, which was 
A European randomized trial tested three to four and a half hours out with TPA and actually found benefit, but with stricter guidelines. So you excluded out people who are less likely to do well regardless of the treatment, and you started to see some benefit, but you also started to see that there was some increased hemorrhagic risk with this. This is an AHA guideline. It is not FDA approved because the FDA wanted a second randomized trial, which nobody in the U.S. was going to do to offer placebo in this situation. So we offer that, as do many others, under a guideline tool. I'll tell you that among some uh, folks, uh, some in the emergency medicine field, just the fact that it's not FDA approved means we're not going to offer it. Okay, that's not happening here at Emory, but it's important to realize that depending on what institution you're in, you may actually be in a situation where people are not going to offer it beyond three hours. One thing that commonly gets missed with IV TPA is that the severity of stroke by the NIH stroke scale makes a big difference in terms of the hemorrhagic risk. So I oftentimes tell people, do not go quoting 6% to every single person you see. Because we know that in large left MCA syndromes, where the stroke scale is typically greater than 20, it's actually a much higher risk. Whereas you can see with milder strokes, it's actually a lower risk. We do not treat patients who have evidence of, on a CT scan of edema because frankly, that's a completed infarct. But in the original NINTS trial, they were doing that, and you can see what the outcomes were. So as a standard, we do not uh, uh, give TPA to those patients. Again, the TPA data with multiple trials showed that the earlier you treat, the less likely you, you are to have disability. You double the odds of having minimal or no disability uh, at three months, if you treat within 60 minutes, as the time goes on, you're less and less likely to reach that minimal or no disability uh, as significantly better than placebo. When you have large artery occlusions, you see this similar type of process where opening up an MCA occlusion at 200 minutes leads to an 85% chance of a good outcome at three months. But again, the line tends to drop to where once you're beyond six hours, you can argue that there may not be a statistically significant difference. The big limitation with these maps is they assume everyone is the same. This is a map of 50-some patients, and the brain does not work in this linear process. The reality is, is you have a patient one who actually is losing brain tissue rapidly as shown here, and you can have patient two who may actually have very minimal loss of brain tissue despite being many hours out beyond patient one. What differentiates the two is what we call your collateral flow. And as I tell patients, collateral flow in Atlanta is like your 285 freeway. If your 75 or 85 is obstructed, how much collateral flow do you have that's feeding into the area that is ischemic? Many people don't know, but anterior cerebral arteries provide a collateral flow to the MCAs, posterior cerebral arteries to the MCAs, and ultimately, people have better or worse collaterals from one person to the other. If you aren't already motivated enough to do cardiovascular exercise, an extra bonus is studies on how much collaterals people have in the brain show that the more cardiovascular exercise you do at baseline, the more likely you are to actually have more of a collateral network than people who don't. So with this time-based focus, you would say, well, hopefully everybody's doing a great job giving time, giving TPA quickly. Well, back in 2011, the National Get With The Guidelines Registry, which we're a part of, published data showing that from when a patient entered into the hospital to when they got TPA, 25% of people were getting TPA within a door-to-needle time of 60 minutes. Since then, within the last year, the current data is we're actually up to uh, slightly above 50% nationally. But a shout out to Emory University Hospital because in 2014, 
out of 2,400 plus hospitals, we were number one as the highest rate of door to TPA treatment within 60 minutes. So then we get into other strategies beyond just TPA. So early on in the course of treatment, there was intraarterial use of TPA. This is an angiogram showing you a left MCA occlusion and opening the artery up. And frequently we encountered these patients and you could give them intraarterial TPA and about half the time you may open the artery up and then you look at the patient the next day and they look just as terrible as they looked beforehand. Then came along Mercy Clot Retriever device, one of the first generation's uh, 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 clot retrievers. It has a native corkscrew configuration which you deployed in the area of a clot. This is a basal or occlusion. You deployed it, you pulled back, you hopefully got the clot, but sometimes the clot was actually more powerful than the Mercy Clot Retriever, and sometimes it would uncoil as it was going through the clot. Not a very good reperfusion tool, but if you were lucky, it opened up the artery. Penumbra suction device came on board, basically a vacuum, taking it up to the, to the clot and turning on a vacuum suction to open the artery up. And actually with these tools, in 2013, New England Journal of Medicine reported out three negative trials on thrombectomy. These were the trials. And there were several big issues that were not recognized early on with these trials. One, there was no consistent vascular imaging being done prior to enrolling these patients into the trial. So if you had a lacunar stroke, you actually were eligible to enroll in the trial. And we know that none of these devices or no intraarterial tools were going to be able to enter into small perforator blood vessels. Second, there was no assessment of tissue at risk versus tissue that had already infarcted to differentiate these. And third of all, there was limited stent retriever use at that time. When these were presented at the major stroke meetings, uh, International Stroke Conference, I'll tell you, this was heartbreak for many interventionists uh, in the world of stroke. Um, nonetheless, some continued to persevere. Stent retrievers came out soon after. Stent retrievers actually are stents that are deployed into the brain. You wait five minutes and basically let the stent interact with the clot, and then you pull back and remove the stent. The advantage of not leaving a stent in is frequently these patients may be getting TPA, and you don't want them from a hemorrhagic risk to be on aspirin, Plavix, and having been on TPA. The people in much of the cardiology studies who are at higher, highest risk for bleeding with triple therapy are your patients with a history of stroke or acute ischemic stroke patients. And so for the brain, hemorrhagic transformation is a big concern that we have. So these stent retrievers came out, and then by 2015, the tides had turned. We now had a New England Journal of Medicine uh, issue that was dedicated to basically many of the positive trials on thrombectomy. That was only a couple of years later. What was the key to the positive trials? Well, the, most of the trials took patients within six hours. One did within 12 hours. Patients had to have pre-stroke disability that was minimal. We're not gonna take somebody in a wheelchair disabled coming in and basically take them and improve them from what their baseline started out with. CT imaging had to show minimal areas of ischemic changes. There had to be some level of disability as we use, defined by an NI stroke score. You had to do vascular imaging with CT or CTA or MRA to confirm that there was a large artery occlusion to go after. And you had to work rapidly once you had confirmed that to go and get the patient reperfused. I'm going to highlight one study here. Uh, one of the lead investigators was one of our neurology uh, interventionists, Raul Nagara, who is one of our Emory Grady neurointerventionists. And this study actually randomized patients to IV TPA alone 
versus IV TPA alone, plus take them to the angio suite for reperfusion with a stent retriever. What I want to highlight here, these are the times uh, between the groups. What I want to highlight is the major delay to patients ultimately getting definitive treatment remains the first piece. Symptom recognition to showing up. That is still the biggest delay that happens in our overall uh, uh, treatment case. Once the patients come in, you can see here, these are at major academic centers. They get their imaging within 25 minutes median time. From that point in time to randomization in this trial, they were 30 minutes. And then from there, you're talking about from randomization to groin puncture, 23 minutes, 24 minutes from groin puncture to actually access at the clot. And within five minutes of access of the clot, there was reperfusion. Okay. Some people ask, well, as we're going to talk about shortly with the data, some people ask, well, why do TPA at all? Well, the reality is, is this is being at an academic center which is, has endovascular capability. Okay. But even there, you're talking about an additional 50 minutes to get reperfusion treatment. If you're not at an endovascular center, TPA has been shown to be beneficial. You should administer it for all eligible patients, and then if there is a drip and ship type model to get patients to your endovascular capable center. So what did this trial show? Well, with stent retriever technology, 88% of people had reperfusion of 50% or more of the occluded area, and 69% of people had 100% reperfusion of the whole territory. What we care about most, how did patients do at three months? If you look at TPA-only patients, one-third of people had minimal or no disability at three months. If you look at the intervention, stent retriever plus TPA, that improved to 60%. Number needed to treat a four to take a patient from disabled to non-disabled. I tell people all the time, you'll be hard-pressed in any field in medicine to show a number needed to treat this low with this big of an impact on uh, patient quality of life. And when you look at not just taking patients to disabled to minimally disabled, but look at patients who went from worse to actually improved, but maybe not improved to the point of minimal or no disability, the number needed to treat actually dropped to two and a half. So when we talk about the Lazarus type moments, frankly, we've come to expect that literally almost every patient or every other patient is going to have this type of outcome when appropriately selected. Are we harming people taking them to stent retrievers uh, and intervention at the cost of uh, helping others? Well, the reality is, is there was no harm shown with the people who went to intervention. And if anything, there was actually a lower risk for symptomatic hemorrhage, though it wasn't statistically significant. So during the course of all of this, it became apparent that we needed to look at beyond just a six-hour time window. Uh, Dr. Noguera, who actually co-led this trial, uh, then looked and basically set up what's called the DAWN trial. The DAWN trial was already in its works to look and see whether you could select patients in the six to 24-hour time window who had mismatch based on CT perfusion or MR perfusion itself. This was actually just published in the New England Journal of Medicine earlier this year. And they took a similar approach, but what they added was the impact of age. So if you were older than 80, you were not going to be able to have as good of a, uh, an outcome if you had a larger infarct. So they set criteria that were lower, uh, lo lower sizes of infarct core for people older than 80 versus patients less than 80 years of age. Age greater than 18, again, last known normal, randomization six to 24 hours out, minimal pre-stroke disability, and you couldn't have a very large infarct greater than one third of the MCA to start with. Primary endpoint was similar to what was done with the other trials, except for one nuance. 
These, uh, the modified Rankine score for some of you who may not know, looks at zero to six. And each of these numbers, this is sort of a nominal type uh, uh, categorization. Zero represents you're back to complete normal. One represents you have symptoms but no signs of any effect from the stroke. And six represents death. Five represents you're completely bedridden. And you can imagine that what, they, what the quality of life amounts to if you're a five is just like death. And if you're a one, quality of life is actually very similar to a zero. So they actually use this utility-weighted modified Rankine score. For your purposes, patients had very large strokes coming in, and I stroke scores median 17. The baseline infarct volume was very, very small. So the amount of purple was very small, uh, similar to the example I showed you with rapid. And the last time seen normal was a median time of 12 to 13 hours. What they ended up showing, sorry if this is small for some of you in the back, but if you didn't do any interventional treatment on these patients, you basically had a 13% likelihood of a good outcome at three months. If you went and took them to intervention, you had about a 50% chance of a good outcome. Now we're talking about a number needed to, to treat of three. If you look at the subgroups, all of them favored thrombectomy. And when you look at the safety outcomes, the biggest impact is when you reduce the size of the stroke, which you do with thrombectomy, you actually see that neurologic deterioration at 24 hours was significantly less in the thrombectomy group. So now when we think about the key concepts, we think about out to 24 hours out. We think about utilizing, again, CT perfusion or MR perfusion. Both are capable of doing it depending on which scanner you're taking the patients to and taking the other strategies that were done within the six hour time frame. I'm not asking anybody to memorize this, but we've developed a algorithm across the system which basically looks at not just anterior circulation, which is studied, but also posterior circulation. One of the things we learned was that in the process of developing this is if you are gonna have a 30 minute conversation between the stroke neurologist and the neurointerventionist about whether we should go or not go for thrombectomy, that was wasting time when we could develop this upfront and come to an agreement about what were the candidates we thought that were most likely to benefit. And so we developed this with the intention of reducing the time to saying, hey, this is a go, activate the team. We're already having um, uh, the team coming in with them. So currently, our potential thrombectomy candidates are large artery occlusion patients, MCA occlusion, internal carotid occlusion, basilar occlusion, or vertebral occlusion with minimal ischemic changes seen on CT or MRI and symptoms presenting within 24 hours of their last known normal. So this actually uh, got reported just within the last couple of weeks, so I just wanted to briefly highlight it. But this study actually, called the wake-up trial, looked to see not in thrombectomy patients, but how about taking this strategy with, taking, with deciding on treating patients with TPA beyond four and a half hours. So what this utilizes is unique features of MRI. Diffusion-weighted imaging, as shown here, as I've shown you, is a very sensitive marker for ischemic tissue that has infarcted. But what we've learned along the way is that there is the flare sequence, which actually takes, by happenstance, about four and a half hours or longer to actually show up as that infarct on flare image. So what this trial did was say, let's take diffusion positive, flare negative patients, and let's randomize them to alteplase versus placebo if they came in beyond four and a half hours. This shows you what typical strokes look like where the diffusion is positive and where you can see the infarct already present on flare. They randomized these patients 
And again, they excluded out the patients with large size strokes to begin with. And they lost funding, 500 out of 800 patients enrolled. But what I want to highlight for you is, and again, this is small for some of you in the back, but of the 1,300 plus patients who were screened, most of them were actually excluded. And the main reason they were excluded was most patients who come in beyond four and a half hours, their last time seen normal, will have diffusion and flare positive. That infarct will be completed. But you do have a subset, 500 out of this 1,300, who actually are diffusion positive and flare negative. Again, they had smaller size strokes, and I strokes here of six are considered in the milder stroke category. They had very small diffusion lesions, so small infarct cores, and the time to getting TPA from symptom recognition was three hours. How did they do? The patients who got TPA had 53% minimal or no disability at three months, compared to placebo, which was at 42%, and you can see it was statistically significant. The main issue with this study was that you were also increasing the risk for death and symptomatic hemorrhage. 4% of patients died, and all 4% actually had a significant major hemorrhagic transformation that led to their death and it was about tenfold higher likelihood of hemorrhagic transformation that was significant compared to the placebo. So the issue with this becomes in acute ischemic stroke patients who are otherwise ineligible for thrombectomy, because as I've shown to you, if you have a large artery occlusion, thrombectomy is actually more effective with lower risk for hemorrhagic transformation than going to MRI and checking a diffusion and a flare to see whether there is mismatch may identify who's eligible for TPA, but this needs an informed consent discussion because of that harm associated. These patients were relatively low NIA stroke scores, meaning those patients, if they would have been left alone, again, 40% would have done actually quite well with just placebo. So just taking this trial and saying we're going to offer and give TPA to every single one who qualifies uh, is a risk of itself. So this needs an important informed consent. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step into uh, a next phase, which is really taking all of this data and saying, well, what do you do about it? So one of the things we did here at Emory University Hospital was say, well, you have patients who could be eligible out to 24 hours. But in our 2017 data, when we looked at it, we've been activating our acute stroke alerts for patients within six hours and patients who wake up with their stroke symptoms, regardless of when they, were, when they went to bed. And so the question becomes, with all of this data, do you suddenly say, we're going to activate our acute stroke alert and mobilize our whole team and for anybody who comes in, day or night, 24 seven, or are you gonna take a different approach? I'll tell you some hospitals, some academic centers and other comprehensive centers have taken the approach that we're going to trigger our acute stroke alerts out to 24 hours for anyone and everyone who comes in within 24 hours. The biggest concern with that, as some have already come back and shared with me, is the impact on physician burnout, which many of you know is a major issue in medicine. Our approach that we took here with all of this data was we said we're gonna to continue to activate the stroke alert within six hours or a wake up stroke. But if they had a last known normal of six to 24 hours and they were not a wake up stroke, we were going to triage them through a stat or a super stat process to get CT, CTA, and CT perfusion to help define are there patients who are otherwise eligible and then activate our stroke alert process. Because many patients who come in beyond six hours, if you're taking and you're not, uh, you're not you know, uniquely selecting out patient by patient, most, most of these patients do not end up qualifying for thrombectomy. 
And so this is the process we've taken, and we're following the data and outcomes uh, and, and looking at that. But it, again, highlights that you want to be thinking about any patient with acute stroke symptoms out to 24 hours as a potential candidate for that treatment. We also have, and Doug asked me to talk about some of the internal processes because it helps you for your patients in terms of just making sure you're aware of what we do to try to get the best treatment to your patients as quickly as possible. We have an inpatient stroke alert process. On non-ICU beds, it goes through the code met process who basically rules out Sim, uh, simple stroke mimics like a blood sugar or like a, uh, an, an opiate um, uh, issue that's causing a patient to be comatose instead of a stroke. And once the code met process uh, rules out those mimics, it activates the stroke alert. If you're in an ICU setting, you don't need a code met process, you don't use a code met process. You actually just call this emergency operator number, 84700, and you basically say, I want to activate an acute stroke alert. You give the patient name, your name, and the location, and that mobilizes the team. What is the team? The team basically brings you a neurology a physician and brings you a neurocritical care nurse on site immediately to the patient bedside. It activates CT, lab, and pharmacy so that they're all mobilized in case we need them. And ultimately, we get the evaluation, we get the key history taking, and we review the imaging and decide who's eligible. Our goal is to get TPA within patients within 45 minutes of that page. Time is brain, as you've seen. And I want to highlight, the stroke alert process is not a TPA page. We have moved beyond TPA as the only treatment to the fact that you don't want to decide whether you're going to activate a stroke alert based on whether that patient's eligible for TPA or not. Because we have thrombectomy, patients do hemorrhage, and we can treat them effectively as well. I want to highlight as the last part, just highlighting some of our outcomes. And we'll finish up here. Emory University Hospital, as Doug pointed out, since 2013 uh, is a certified comprehensive stroke center by the Joint Commission. We have metrics that we track. These are inpatient metrics. Uh, as you can see here, we're happy to say that they're all near 100%. We have comprehensive stroke center metrics, which center around severity scores, which center around interventional treatments and how patients do, and all of our time frames as well. This gives you a sense of where our in-hospital mortality rates are compared to the region and the nation. Ischemic, acute ischemic stroke, you can see here, there's generally low mortality rates with acute ischemic stroke in the current era of stroke care, but you can see we're uh, better than region and nation. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, you can see here again, we're significantly better than region and nation. And intracranial hemorrhage, again, you can see here, we're significantly better than the region and the nation here. I wanted to highlight to you, we talked about the clinical trials, SWIFT Prime and the DAWN trial. I wanted to show you here, in Emory University Hospital, at three month follow up, 91% of eligible SWIFT Prime patients who are treated here in Emory University Hospital were actually at uh, minimal or no disability of three months. Actually, in this case, the one patient who wasn't was actually a patient who went to rehab and ended up having a fall and fracturing their femur. And so they weren't walking independently at three months. So we give ourselves an uh, excuse for that one. Um, in the Don trial, you can see that for eligible patients who met Don criteria, all the patients uh, 90 days had minimal or no disability. Now what I want to highlight to you that these were all the cases that we treated. And you can see here, 44% had minimal or no disability and 54% had, were walking independently or had minimal or no disability by three months. So why the differences? 
Well, the differences are recognizing that these trials were taking patients with very small infarct cores before you went in for reperfusion. So you had the most to gain. What we have been doing, and I'm highlighting here for you, are the areas where thrombectomy is not necessarily leading to as good of results. To highlight to you that thrombectomy isn't the cure for everyone. So basal or occlusion patients, all the trials have looked at anterior circulation. They have not looked at basal or occlusion. The biggest issue with the brain stem is there are a lot of small perforators that come off of the basal artery. It's very easy for, in the process of removing a clot, to basically get a small blood clot getting into a perforator, and though you save the whole brain stem, if you end up with a small perforator stroke in the pons or in the midbrain, you leave that patient hemiplegic. So that's one of the concerns. No CT perfusion. Some patients were taken directly to angiogram without going to CT perfusion. And again, this is where we know that if the patient is not is having a large area of core infarct, they're less likely to do as well. Another example. Well, these trials have shown a small core leads to a good outcome, but maybe we're not trying to get every patient to have minimal or no disability. Maybe a patient who comes in with 100 cc's of core and 200 cc's of tissue at risk may actually still benefit from thrombectomy, but they're not gonna walk out the door uh, going home. Maybe it's going to take a year to see the benefits from that. So these are being evaluated in ongoing trials. And we're taking patients in older than 80 and even older than 90. And so again, you know, they are less able to withstand even small infarcts that develop in, despite reperfusion saving a large territory at risk. These are many of the, I'm not going to go through each one, but these are the, the various awards we've gotten through the years, which we're very proud of. And most importantly, I want to say here that as the case highlighted initially, organized stroke care matters. It matters to, in the cardiology world, we're behind the cardiology world. There is a mission lifeline stroke element. It's more active in some states than others, but our goal and my goal has been to become as streamlined within Emory Healthcare. This map I had here doesn't include DeKalb Medical, which we'll continue to, to, to work with as well. But the goal is, is we wanna say that if you're at an Emory facility, you're gonna get the best stroke care. And if you're at a primary stroke center and you need endovascular treatment, we're gonna get you to a comprehensive stroke center as quickly as possible for that definitive treatment. And just to highlight here, this is the work of a team of many people. Um, Doug uh, invited me to share this. I wanna tell you that this kind of outlines all the things you have to have in place to be a certified comprehensive stroke center by the Joint Commission. This requires a, a big administrative uh, uh, support to really support a neuroscience program that really achieves these great outcomes. And I will tell you, uh, you should feel proud to be here and to be cared for at Emory when it comes to neuroscience and stroke care. So as a summary, acute stroke treatment is shifting from a time-based treatment algorithm to a tissue-based treatment algorithm. Acute stroke treatments, including IV, TPA, and thrombectomy, are very effective when treatment is initiated soon after stroke. I want to highlight here that if you try to talk to your patients and tell them a list of the 20-plus stroke symptoms that may be a sign of a stroke, they will remember close to zero, as our studies and others show. So things have kind of coalesced into FAST. Facial droop, F, A, arm weakness with drift, S, speech trouble, slurred speech or trouble getting your words out, and T, time call 911. 
That covers about three quarters of stroke presentations. It's easier for patients to remember, and at least they'll be able to remember that than trying to give them a list of 20 that they won't be able to remember. And lastly, you have an outstanding Emory Stroke Team to support your patients in the region. So with that said, I'll be happy to take any questions or comments. So, Fadi, that was outstanding. Thank you very much. Uh, really uh, marvelous update. Can you tell me a little bit more about collaterals? And, and uh, you mentioned cardiovascular uh, activities to enhance collaterals. Can you talk about that a bit more? So, uh, great question and an important one. In the cerebrovascular area, this has only in the last year or two become more and more of a focus. Uh, several important things we know. There's a big component of pre-ischemic conditioning that plays into this. So patients we commonly see who may have carotid stenosis, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90%, who despite the lower flow have dramatic amounts of collaterals. So pre-ischemic conditioning, thought to be due to a variety of mechanisms that are very similar to some in the cardiovascular realm, seem to play an important role in that pre-ischemic conditioning. The cardiovascular activity data, I'll tell you, was looked at in one of the trials which we were part of looking at intracranial stenting for intracranial atherosclerosis. Uh, it was a cross-sectional study looking at the exercise activity at baseline and then looking at all the angiograms to see and found that it was predictive. The studies on which biomarkers may be mediating that are actually still haven't been published and are still being looked at. But those studies were looking at endothelial progenitor cells, um, were looking at PI-1 um, and few other uh, biomarkers that were involved there. Um, just within the last couple of years, the focus has become so important that a intracranial uh, uh, collaterals conference has become uh, a once a year hosted at UCLA um, conference. Uh, so I think we have a lot more to learn about it because if we're thinking about preventive strategies, this is clearly the way to go. Sorry, just to bring focus to this, if you had somebody that had a stroke, say, something in Atlanta, would you have the right to say, I want to go to a comprehensive medical center with a hemorrhage with infarct treatment to know what something like that would uh, be? Uh, great question. So the question centers around a, a, a patient's right to be able to guide where they're going to go. So Georgia law, and Georgia actually was ahead of the game with this as opposed to other states, and much of, much of this is because Paul Coverdale, who had had a stroke, um, actually Georgia became one of the a state senator from Georgia years ago. Uh, actually, Georgia was one of the uh, Coverdale states and remains a Coverdale state. But legislation pushed forward with any EMS thinking that a patient had a, subsus, a suspected stroke of going to your closest certified stroke center. This is what actually motivated many of the hospitals to become certified because they would otherwise lose patient referrals. More recently with the thrombectomy era data, the American Heart America Stroke Association started, uh, came out with a panel to look at an algorithm to guide who should go to primaries and who should go to comprehensives. As you can imagine, there's a lot of politics with this. They ended up coming up with an algorithm that sort of defined a 30-minute time frame to say, well, if you are at, if you are suspecting a large artery occlusion, which many EMS uh, uh, folks are not currently trained to do, but we, which we've started to have validated 
um, uh, pre-hospital uh, tools uh, that can identify who's more likely to have a large artery occlusion. But if you're within, within 30 minutes time frame from a comprehensive, take them to the comprehensive. Whereas if you're greater than 30 minutes, take them to the primary, hopefully they get TPA, and then hopefully they get shipped to the comprehensive right away. As with the cardiology world, that frankly, uh, and early on, has not worked so great because we see our door, the door in, door out times in hospitals lasting two plus hours, okay? So what you have a right to do at this point is you have a right to be taken to the primary stroke, to a certified stroke center, but your right to go to a comprehensive stroke center that bypasses a primary center closer is actually at the discretion of EMS, and EMS by law does not have any requirement or, uh, to bypass uh, a primary stroke center. Sometimes they do bypass, sometimes they don't bypass. Uh, and we encourage our patients um, who live nearby to say, tell them, I only want to go directly. Because if it's your loved one, if it's our loved ones, we obviously want to get them to a comprehensive stroke center. I will tell you this isn't a perfect uh, uh, ironed out issue. The original algorithm for the AHASA said if you're having a thunderclap headache, go to a comprehensive stroke center. When I saw that as part of a review they gave us, they said, no way. We're going to be flooded, inundated, with headache patients who have nothing to do with the subarachnoid hemorrhage. And the data would all suggest that thunderclap headaches are about 60% uh, benign headaches. And so it's not perfect, and the biggest limitation centers around imaging. Uh, as some of you have heard, so we, we uh, started at Grady uh, and working with Emory Healthcare and Grady uh, Mobile Stroke Unit. Uh, it has a CT in it. My personal opinion is I don't think that's going to make the biggest public health impact. I think it's great if you get picked up by it, but I don't think it's, it's financially feasible to make it work and to be a national uh, standard. But I think more data will, will evolve uh, over time with it, um, and it's currently limited to, to uh, just certain key counties. Okay. Okay. We thank you very much, Fadi. Thank you. Awesome.